same page. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast. Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. You can get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash I Know Dino. There's over 180,000 titles to choose from on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. So check it out. We also want to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. It really helps us with our hosting fees and all that good stuff. And it helps us to keep making podcasts for you guys. And it's a lot of fun. And we're building up a good community on Patreon. So if you want to join them, please check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Yeah. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about our dinosaur of the day, Tethys Hadros, and some dinosaur news. First in the news, we'd like to start off with new dinosaur discoveries when we have those. And this week, there's an article in PLOS One titled, A Basal Lithostradian Titanosaur with a Complete Skull, Implications for the Evolution and Paleobiology of Titanosauria. It was written by Ruben D.F. Martinez and others. So they found a new titanosaur, and they named it Sarmientosaurus musachioi. And the name meaning from the paper is, quote, Sarmiento for the Patagonian town and the administrative department in which it is located. And the specific name honors the late Eduardo Musacchio, a model scientist and educator at the Universidad Nacional de la Patagonia San Juan Bosco in Comodoro, Rivadavia, Argentina, end quote. It was discovered in the Bajo Boreal Formation, which is estimated to be from about 100 to 90 million years ago. And interestingly, it looks more like older sauropods than other ones known from that same time. So Sarmientosaurus probably evolved from a quote-unquote ghost lineage in the early mid-Cretaceous. Scientifically speaking, a ghost lineage really means that it's a more basal or archaic member of Lithosauria, which leads us to believe that it evolved from still undiscovered dinosaurs alongside other known lithosaurids. At first I was a little disappointed that they didn't find too much of the skeleton, they just found the skull with teeth and several neck vertebrae, but it turns out that the titanosaur skulls are actually really rare. And according to co-author Matthew Lamana, quote, more than 60 legit titanosaur species have been named to date, end quote, but it's only the fourth to have an entire skull. So that's pretty unique that there are only four titanosaurs with complete skulls, and this is one of them. The skull is also probably better preserved than other sauropods from South America. On top of that, they also found an ossified tendon which is pretty cool and a little bit unique. The really neat thing about Sarmientosaurus is that it has a downward-facing snout. There were some news articles that compared it to Eeyore because it has like a little bit of a droopy head. <laughs> <laughs> and it has highly pneumatized neck vertebrae, which haven't been documented in, in other titanosaurs. These are adaptations similar to some diplodocids, which would have helped them eat low-growing vegetation rather than high-browsing. With the well-preserved skull, they were able to CT scan it and model some of the organs like the inner ear. And they think that based on the inner ear alignment, that it would have held its head at that downward-pointing angle. Apparently, it kind of orients itself to what the typical down position is at rest, and its at-rest position with, was with its head kind of pointed down. They also think that based on the inner ear, it may have been able to hear lower frequencies than other titanosaurs, and it had really big eye sockets, which may mean that it had big eyes with better vision than its relatives too. The structure of the skull also helps us to see where titanosaurs fit within the sauropod tree. Quote, Sarmientosaurus provides a wealth of new cranial evidence that reaffirms the close relationship of titanosaurus to Brachiosauridae. End quote. So basically, there were a couple of key features in the skull shape that we hadn't seen in the, I guess, three complete titanosaur skulls that we had found so far. But this one is kind of a little bit more of a missing link type thing. It shows a little bit more of the evolution. So it's pretty cool. We always like new dinosaurs. Hopefully they find more skulls soon. 
I guess there hadn't been too much excavation going on in this particular dinosaur dig site, and they were saying, now we know that it's a really important space to dig in, so hopefully they do some more excavation there. Yeah, that'd be good. Maybe they'll find some piglet-looking dinosaurs, or Winnie the Pooh, to go with Eeyore. (laughs) Probably not, but who knows? Probably not. Maybe owl-looking ones. Yeah. Next in the news is another sauropod-related article. This one's called Nuchal Ligament Reconstructions in Diplodocid Sauropods Support Horizontal Neck Feeding Postures. And it was published in Historical Biology, written by D. Carey Woodruff. So in humans, the nuchal ligament attaches to that bump in the middle at about ear level on the back of the head to a vertebra at the base of the neck. So it kind of holds your head up a little bit and it's useful in running. It Apparently it flexes a little bit more than a typical ligament which helps to store energy and pigs don't have them which makes them really bad runners. But anyway, in modern animals like cattle it holds its head up off the ground which is obviously more of what you would expect in something like a sauropod than something that stands perfectly upright like we do. But the key detail of this study was the difference between diplodocid necks compared with other sauropods. So diplodocids have what are called bifurcated spines, and that means that the vertebrae look a little bit different. They basically have two things sticking out of the top of them rather than just one in the middle. There are these things called neural spines on vertebrae. And if you imagine on like a Spinosaurus where it has the really tall spines that stick up, normal vertebrae have those too, but they're just much shorter on most animals. And then on diplodocids, rather than having one sticking straight up, they have two that are kind of sticking up at angles on either side, more like stegosaurus plates kind of thing. Obviously those aren't vertebrae, but you get the idea of where they're pointed, generally speaking. So... There's been some debate about what exactly the benefits are to having the bifurcated spines and where ligaments would have attached, what would have run in between them versus around the outside, would it just have been empty in the middle, or what would have gone on. The new article is saying that the nuchal ligament may have divided into two parts along the neck and then attached to both sides of the spine. So the tendon would be a single piece at either end and then it kind of splits out with like a hole in the middle like the eye of a needle in the middle of where it attaches to the neck. Why would you want this weird tendon that splits in half? Apparently it would have given them a better ability to sweep their necks back and forth when they're feeding. So if you pull your neck to one side it would build extra tension on the other side of the tendon and then it would help you bring the neck back without expending too much energy swinging your neck back and forth. Woodruff has a few comparisons to mechanical systems and some modern animals that use similar ligaments to do this kind of thing, and he thinks that it's good enough to show that diplodocids probably did sweep their necks back and forth and then also eat really low-lying vegetation like ferns rather than picking off trees. But Woodruff does indicate that Brachiosaurus and Giraffa Titan did not have the same type of spine, so they probably held their heads higher off the ground than diplodocids. But he believes that his research adds support to the more modern depiction of sauropods holding their heads much closer to the ground than the older models shows. So I guess it's just one more piece of evidence that sauropods kind of had their heads near to the ground, sweeping around rather than up in the trees like a giraffe. At least diplodocids probably did. Yep, they knew how to eat efficiently. They had to eat a lot. Next in the news, there's an article titled Dinosaur Biogeographical Structure and Mesozoic Continental Fragmentation, a Network-Based Approach. It was published in the Journal of Biogeography, and it has a full article available, which I always like. It was written by Alexander M. Dunhill and others. And as a quick background, in the early Triassic, Pangaea was going on, so all of the continents were pretty much connected, but by the end of the Cretaceous, all of the continents were more or less separated. But the exact timing of the separation is still a major area of research because the animal diversity can be greatly affected by continents joining or separating, so it is pretty important to know when they were separated, when they were attached, 
but it can be confounded by the fact that sea level rises and drops quite a bit. And when there is an ice age, it can reconnect continents that were previously separated, allowing animals to migrate where you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be able to based on the position. So Dunhill and his colleagues modeled the planet in the Mesozoic, including both direct continental contact and, quote, sea level condition connections. And they combine that with information from shared dinosaur families to create what they call biogeographical networks. With all the modeling, they showed throughout time when dinosaurs could have moved in between the continents and the relative rates of their movement based on related dinosaurs that can be found on the different continents. And even when the continents had already separated, they showed that dinosaurs were still moving between them. So they said, quote, the discrepancies between the geographical and biogeographical network models, that is, the reduced but continued intercontinental faunal exchange right up to the end of the Cretaceous, suggests that although continental splitting certainly reduced the exchange of terrestrial clads, it did not completely inhibit it, end quote. So essentially they found that most dinosaur lineages were able to move all around the world throughout the Mesozoic, even in the late Cretaceous, although they didn't move quite as much as they did in the early phases when there was still Pangaea going on. They do say that, quote, there is some evidence to suggest that increased continental and biogeographical isolation led to increased origination and extinction rates in some dinosaurian clads. These findings fit with the hypothesis that dinosaurian evolution was influenced by decreased migration between continental landmasses and increased regional extinction throughout the Mesozoic, end quote. So the continental drift did impact the dinosaurs, but it didn't set up completely isolated areas for dinosaurs to diversify in, like I had previously imagined, and I think is the more intuitive way to think of it. You know, you imagine South America splitting off from Africa, and now you have completely different dinosaurs evolving in those places. Like we saw in the study where they were trying to specifically define that period, you still saw dinosaurs popping up in other places when the continents had been physically separated for quite a while. But unfortunately, although we have found a lot of fossils in North America and Europe, there are large areas of Africa and South America that are virtually unexplored, which makes our picture of dinosaur development across the continents really incomplete. And Africa being kind of in the middle of all of this movement especially makes it difficult to see where dinosaurs were moving around. So hopefully those areas get better explored and we can kind of see where dinosaurs were showing up, which ones are related to which others, and it gives you a better picture of how the continents were moving and when they were connected. We have another article that's about the end of the dinosaurs' reign and what exactly was going on with them. This one's called Dental Disparity and Ecological Stability in Bird-Like Dinosaurs Prior to the End Cretaceous Mass Extinction. Dun dun dun! Yeah, quite a title. It was published in Current Biology and written by Derek Larson, Caleb Brown, and David Evans. So what they were doing was looking at patterns in diversity in Manoraptor and teeth near the KPG extinction. So the hypothesis was that if there was reduced diversity in bird-like dinosaurs' teeth, that could show that there was a reduced diversity of those bird-like dinosaurs, and furthermore, that they were in decline. Like we talked about with Dr. Sakamoto, if there are less dinosaurs around, less species, dinosaur species are going extinct faster than new ones are evolving, that indicates that they're not doing so well. They're probably getting out-competed by other animals. So they wanted to see if that was the case. So Larson and his team analyzed 3,104 fossilized teeth, which is quite a lot of teeth, many of which were described for the first time in this article. They looked at the last 18 million years dinosaurs were around, so just the late Cretaceous and not a wide range of the Mesozoic like Dr. Sakamoto did. And ultimately, they determined that the diversity of Manoraptorin specifically was stable and didn't show signs of decline until the extinction event. This is a much smaller subset of dinosaurs than we talked about with Dr. Sakamoto, but Manoraptorans are a very important group to focus on since they are believed to be the group that eventually evolved into modern birds. Interestingly, they propose that many Neorns, 
without teeth were the ones that survived the KPG boundary, and they surmise that that's likely due to their diet of grain rather than meat. And it kind of makes sense that there aren't any birds around now with teeth, so maybe that's when all the teeth-having birds went extinct and we ended up with just the beaky ones. I'm kind of glad the ones with teeth went extinct. Yeah, it'd be kind of scary. All the beaks can, those hooked beaks that eagles and stuff have can still Imagine a do hooked some damage. beak with teeth. Yeah, that's true. That's not true. <laughs> it is kind of weird when you think about it that the predatory birds, none of them have teeth. Mm -hmm. You'd think it would be useful. I guess they have the claws and stuff. So it looks like there were quite a few groups of dinosaurs that were doing very well in the late Cretaceous, like Ceratopsians, Hadrosaurs, and now Manoraptorans can be added to that group. But things like sauropods and maybe some of the other dinosaurs weren't necessarily doing as well. Next, thanks to Phil via Facebook for this one, in Antarctica, an international team of 12 scientists from the US, Australia, and South Africa have found fossils of dinosaurs and other animals that are about 71 million years old from the late Cretaceous. The trip to Antarctica was apparently very difficult, not surprisingly. The team flew to South America, and then it took them five days to get through the Drake Passage, which is known for its rough seas. Steve Salisbury, a scientist from the University of Queensland who went on the expedition, said, quote, It's a very hard place to work, but it's an even harder place to get to. <laughs> The team spent five weeks on the expedition, and it will take years to properly study the fossils that they found, but for now, the fossils are going to Chile and then to Pittsburgh's Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Just for reference, four dinosaurs that have been found in Antarctica include the herbivores Antarcticopelta olive roy, Trinisaura santa martaensis, and Glacialosaurus hammeri, and the carnivore Crylophosaurus elliotti, which we talked about in episode 68. Yeah, that one's pretty crazy. In an interview with Philip J. Curry, he talked about how it took him, I think, 20 years to uncover it because you have to leave so often you can only be there in the middle of the summer because otherwise it's impossible to do anything outside. Mm -hmm. And even then, while he was there, the warmest it ever was was something like minus 20 degrees, and it was often negative 40. <laughs> and the, he said they spent most of the time hunkered down waiting for weather and not as much time out in the field. So you can see why not very many dinosaurs have been discovered in Antarctica. Just crazy to think about the penguins and other animals that live there now. Yeah, not great. Speaking of experts going somewhere and doing discovery work, the drilling has started on the Chicxulub Peak Ring that we talked about earlier. As a reminder, it's a team of scientists that went down to the Chicxulub Impact Site on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico, and... They're slightly offshore where they can drill directly down into the peak ring. And the peak ring is not the edge of the crater. It's kind of two thirds of the way, probably, from the center towards the edge of the crater. And it's a remnant when you have big impacts. The land gets kind of liquefied and it splashes up and then back down, and you're left with this interesting ring. So they want to dig into it. And according to Science Magazine, in early May, the team drilling into the peak reached the first clear sign that they made it deep enough to be at the peak ring. It was about 670 meters down, or 2,200 feet, which is remarkably close to their original estimate of 650 meters. The 3 meter or 10 foot core section had a combination of granite and minerals, and they planned to drill all the way down to about 1,500 meters. So they're really only about a third of the way down now. Now that they've reached the peak ring, they will likely take things a little bit more slowly because in the beginning they were just drilling through the seafloor and that was intended to be a quicker process where they were just kind of trying to get through it so they could get to what they were interested in. They weren't taking big core samples all the time. Unfortunately, there have been some local fishermen that have been upset by the drilling, saying that it's scaring off fish and they were briefly threatening to storm the drill platform and demand payment, but apparently tempers have cooled, so hopefully that doesn't become a problem. We're looking forward to seeing more, and I'm excited to see an official press release where they describe all the things that they've found, but apparently they're spending all their time doing the actual science and not talking to the media much because I couldn't find many reports. That and, makes sense. Yeah, and one of them said that they were all 
operating on very little sleep and getting delirious. So yeah. better to leave them to their work. We'll learn about it eventually. Yeah. They must be finding a lot. Yeah, there's a ton to see, I'm sure. Next, Comic Book Resources recommends the Marvel comic Howard the Duck, number seven, so the specific issue, which follows Howard and his friends as they end up in some sort of dinosaur theme park known as the Savage Land. And the cover features the characters inside a T-Rex mouth, so I assume it's an epic issue. But I'd never heard of Howard the Duck before. Yeah, I me mean, either. Is it like a duck superhero? I wonder what's going on there. I think so. Huh. No idea what his powers are or anything. Hmm. In other comic news, Geek Dad recommends a new science book comic series for kids ages 9 to 13, and the first book in the series is called Dinosaurs, Fossils, and Feathers, and it's very visual with the most current science facts incorporated. The publisher is first, second, and we've actually talked about this book in a previous episode. We talked about how it was coming out, but now the actual comic is out, so we'll post a link where you can buy it on our blog. Next up, we talk a lot about virtual reality, but we've also mentioned augmented reality before with the dino on my desk back in episode 56. As a reminder, it's a technology where you can download an app onto your tablet or smartphone, and then you print out a piece of paper that has some key graphics on it so the app knows what it is, and then a dinosaur appears on top of it on your screen, sort of like if you were taking a picture and the dinosaur was actually there. But now there's a new company called Octagon Studios, which is expanding on that idea. They have a series of cards. For instance, there's one with a monkey on it, and it has lots of information about the monkey, and it's supposed to be an educational experience. And if you point the camera at the monkey, then a monkey shows up on top of the card. And then there's also a card with bananas on it, so it has information about bananas, and if you point the camera at it, banana show up but if you point it at both of them in a row then the monkey will run over and start trying to like eat the bananas <laughs> that's <laughs> cute so they're making it a little more interactive but there are some dinosaur things that are even cooler dinosaurs eating bananas unfortunately i don't think there are any dinosaurs eating from what i've seen <laughs> <laughs> but they do have two t-shirts one of them has a sauropod in an egg on it and if you point a cell phone or whatever at it you'll see a virtual dinosaur in an egg appear right in front of the t-shirt and then the baby breaks out of the eggshell and it's kind of standing there being cute and then there's another shirt that has an adult sauropod on it and obviously you point it there and the adult sauropod shows up and if you do both of them then the baby runs over to the adult and they start kind of like nuzzling and stuff it's pretty cute so i think it's a really cool idea but from the video, it looks like it's still a little bit finicky, kind of like the Dino on my desk app, where it's not consistent enough to look like it's actually in the room. It's a little bit jittery. It's obviously early technology, so you can tell that it's being superimposed and refreshed all the time. But still, it's really cool, and I like the idea of having interactive t-shirts like this, especially since most of the t-shirts I buy these days have dinosaurs on them anyway. Yeah. <laughs> The most interactive one you have right now is the Stegosaurus, where if you stand in the sun, you can see the contents of its stomach. That's true. Those look kind of like bananas. Eh. <laughs> in more book news, Adventure Publications recently released Dinosaur Destinations, which, quote, features guides to popular dinosaurs of North America as well as guides to other prehistoric creatures. This book seems to be ideal for those who want to travel and see dinosaur sites, and some of the highlights include Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada, and Purgatory River Dinosaur Track site in Colorado. Cool. Add that to our list of places to see. We might be going to Dinosaur Provincial Park soon. What huh. do you think of that? Pretty cool. <laughs> Next, this kind of combines comics. I was going to say Marvel, but it's actually DC Comics <laughs> with books. So, if any of you out there watch The Flash on the CW, they recently had an episode called The Runaway Dinosaur. And what's interesting is that a big part of the episode was based on this book called The Runaway Dinosaur, which unfortunately is not a real book. I was actually pleasantly surprised they read part of the story in the episode and it, I could see it being a real children's book and something that would be really popular. And what was cool about it was it seemed like the people who wrote that book, or at least the part that was read in the episode, knew what they were talking about. So the whole concept is that it's about this Myasaur dinosaur and his mother, which makes sense since Myasaur is the good mother dinosaur, good mother lizard. And this Myasaur is 
tired of being a small dinosaur. So he tells his mom, like, well, I want to be bigger. I want to be like a T-Rex. And the mother says, well, how can I hug you if you have tiny arms like a T-Rex? <laughs> and then the, the little Myasaurus says, well, what if I was really big like a sauropod? And then the mother says, well, how will you hear me being up so high when I yell to you, I love you? And it's actually this really touching story. It's kind of like is the llama my mama with dinosaurs. Kind of, yeah. I kind of hope that they turn this into a real book. <laughs> Apparently, if you look really closely, I read this in a forum somewhere, you can see that the book is, because they have a cover made, you can see that the book is written by somebody called Helbing. And Aaron and Todd Helbing are producers and sometimes writers on the show. So maybe they'll come out with a book if they're writers. Maybe. That'd be exciting. It's a good concept. Next, in Sydney, Australia, two parents have asked the Guinness World Records if their four-year-old son could have the title Youngest Dinosaur Educator. According to the parents, he's memorized more than 30 dinosaur species by looking at pictures, and he can pronounce all the names correctly. And he can also recite dinosaur traits, when they lived, and what they ate. He can't yet read, but he learned facts from watching Dinosaur Train and from prompt cards. And his parents are obviously very supportive. They said, quote, we wanted recognition that he is young and is doing an amazing job. Whether he wins it or not, for us, it doesn't really matter that much. We want him to continue to learn, and this is encouragement for him. We're so proud of him, and we're happy to see where he goes from here, end quote. So it's really great how supportive they are, and it's wonderful to hear about these dinosaur enthusiasts of all ages, even dinosaur enthusiasts who are too young to read. And this reminds me of my little cousin who's around the same age, his name is Jackson, and he can pronounce all dinosaur names correctly. And I know he teaches his grandparents all kinds of cool dinosaur facts because they've been emailing us some awesome things. <laughs> yep. So, hey, maybe if they turn a youngest dinosaur educator into a title, Jackson could go for it too. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That'd be a competition. Could be. Next, the actor Chris Hemsworth baked his four-year-old daughter a T-Rex cake after the bakery said that they didn't have time to make the cake for him, which seems kind of odd. But he used upside-down M&Ms to help decorate the dinosaur, and he placed them upside-down so that you don't see the M&M logo. It doesn't ruin the effect. <laughs> and last, thanks to at Vigoigo on Twitter for this one, T-Rex Tuesdays, which is hosting a dinosaur party on a local football field in Minnesota, has now opened up the party for those who can't make it but would still like to attend in spirit. We've talked about this event before, but now there's this extra thing. So for $5, you can, quote, buy a dinosaur figurine that will attend the event for you, end quote. And they'll take pictures with your names next to the figurine. And then all figurines will be donated to the children's hospitals and clinics of Minnesota after the event. So that's pretty nice. Yeah. Before we go into our dinosaur of the day, we want to again bring up our sponsor, Audible because they're offering a free audiobook download with a 30-day trial to give you an opportunity to check out their service. As a reminder, we just published one of our dinosaur books written by Sabrina on Audible. It's titled What Happened to Brontosaurus, and you can get it for free with this offer. So all you have to do is you go to audibletrial.com slash inodino, audibletrial.com slash inodino, and sign up for a 30-day free trial, and then you get a free audiobook. So once you're there, you can search for Brontosaurus, and there are three books with Brontosaurus in the title on Audible, and Sabrina wrote one of them. Pretty obvious, because it says, written by Sabrina. <laughs> <laughs> and it's got a little cover with a green cartoon Brontosaurus with big, cute eyes looking out at you. It's a children's book that kind of talks about the trials and tribulations of Brontosaurus, or more specifically, what happened with the naming of Brontosaurus. So for about a hundred years, it was thought that the name Brontosaurus was a mistake and that it was the same as Apatosaurus. But then in 2015, which we covered on this show, paleontologists looked at a bunch of different Brontosaurus bones and found that they were different enough to warrant being named its own genus. It's a really good way to explain to kids what went on with brontosaurus and it's got some cool little facts about brontosaurus in there too so if you're into audiobooks especially children's book audiobooks it's a good way to get a free one so definitely so yeah check it out on audible what happened to brontosaurus and go through audibletrial.com slash i know dino to get your free copy and now for our dinosaur of the day tethys hadris insularis which was a request from ricardo via patreon so thanks ricardo 
The genus name is after Tethys, an ocean that was in the Alpine Himalayan orogenic belt, and the fact that it's a hadrosauroid. And the type species is Tethys hadros insularis. And insularis means insular or of the island. And at the time, Tethys hadros lived, it lived on the Adriatic Dinaric Island, which is a large island of the European archipelago. It was described in 2009 by Fabio Marca Dalla Vecchia, an Italian paleontologist. And the site where Tethys hadros was found was discovered in the 80s by Ozio Tarlo and Giorgio Rimoli. And a student named Tiziana Brazzati found hand bones in the area in 1994. A company called Stone Age, which deals with fossils, got a commission to excavate fossils, and they had to remove more than 300 tons of rock. And Dalavecchia helped guide the project. And the holotype, Tethys hadros, which is nicknamed Antonio, was taken out of the quarry in 1999, though slightly damaged. Six other Tethys hadros specimens were found, though one fell apart during excavation, and another one there were only four limbs found. Tethys hadros is a hadrosauroid that lived in what is now Italy, and in 2009, Fabio Marco Dalla Vecchia named Tethys hadros in a paper in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology called Tethys hadros insularis, a new hadrosauroid dinosaur, Ornithischia, from the Upper Cretaceous of Italy. Again, the holotype is of a mostly complete skeleton, and nicknamed Antonio, and it's one of the most complete dinosaur skeletons found. According to the paper, quote, the specimen is the most complete skeleton among medium to large sized dinosaurs found in Europe since the 1878 discovery of Iguanodon and Dolodon at Bernissart, Belgium, end quote. And the holotype, they figure it was about five to six years old. It has a mix of derived and primitive features, and it was about 13 feet or 4 meters long and weighed 770 pounds or 350 kilograms. It had a large elongated skull and a short neck and tail and long legs. It was possibly a fast runner based on its long legs and not having too many toes. And Dallavecchia said that it's small because of insular dwarfism. And insular dwarfism is when animals are on an island and they have limited resources so they become smaller over time. Dallavecchia said that basal hadrosauroids were probably island hopping from Asia, which is how Tethys hadros ended up on an island in Europe. He doesn't think that it comes from European or American hadrosaurs. So over time, sea levels may have changed and lands moved around, making it possible to island hop. And the Tethys Ocean covered most of southern Europe at the time. Tethys hadros had a serrated snowplow-shaped beak, not a duck-like beak as hadrosaurs are known for, and this upper beak was pointed. It's unclear why the beak looked the way it did. It could have been for display or grooming or biting certain types of vegetation. The fossils are now at the Civico Museo di Storia Naturale di Trieste. And you can see an animation of Antonio online, and we'll post the link on our blog. So, Hadrosauroidea, which Tethys hadros is part of, is a superfamily of duck-billed dinosaurs, or hadrosaurids, and dinosaurs more closely related to them than Iguanodon. Interesting. And our fun fact of the day is kind of a correction or an elaboration on something we talked about recently, which is the trees down versus ground up debate. And trees down is characterized by gliding dinosaurs starting to flap eventually, versus the ground up is dinosaurs that had feathers starting to use their wings for the WAIR, the wing assisted incline running, so called wear, to get up trees quickly. So it's why did they evolve flapping is really the question. And it's still hotly contested. I talked last week about some of the issues with trees down. But there is one really big problem with ground up that I didn't mention, and I learned about it in that theropod evolution class that's offered by the University of Alberta. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, it's a good class to take. So unlike baby birds, which use WAIR, early theropods had claws, which probably would have been a better way to climb than flapping proto wings. So it's still unclear exactly how flight developed. Because if you imagine a small, semi-avian, I guess, <laughs> dinosaur running towards a tree, the theory was, oh, they could use their wings and then they could get up the tree more quickly. But if you have claws, you could almost certainly just scamper up it with your claws because they tended to be small and have claws and you'd just be like a squirrel running up a tree. They can ascend trees very quickly, so why would you need wings for that? That's basically the big issue with wing-assisted incline running. 
I tend to think that wear is a bit more useful overall since it could work on a larger variety of surfaces. I imagine them trying to run up something like loose soil or hard, smooth rock, and wings might be more useful in that situation than trying to dig claws into it. But that's a pretty specific case to evolve such an impressive trait for, so it's still a little bit unclear why they would have needed to evolve these wings. But another cool thing is the Hoatzin is a modern herbivorous bird that actually, as a chick, has claws on the ends of its wings, just like you'd see in some of these dinosaurs. So I really want to see if those chicks use wear or if they use their claws to climb trees if they're in trouble. I think that would be a great thing to study. The birds that they used for the WAIR study we talked about last week didn't have any sort of claws, so they didn't have that as an option. Interesting. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening, and if you like what you hear and like learning about dinosaurs, then please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash I Know Dino. And big thank you to all our current Patreon supporters. We really, really appreciate you guys. Until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.